Shed Extension Specialist. And uh, I went in for quite a while. We've done some work before. I initially met with Mel Torres, no longer. Mel, Mel brought me over to UC Davis and, and wanted to try to try to educate me a little bit about the real world and real watershed management and those sorts of things. And it didn't work, so we had to send him back. <laughs> it didn't work. So anyway, so Ken has been gracious enough to give us a great presentation about why, why we were, some of the reasons about it. I, I asked him, why do we want to manage grazing? So I, um, I tend to work at the interface of livestock production and environmental issues on rangelands. And so I often think about livestock distribution as us trying to get cattle or livestock not to do something we don't want them to do. And so I'm going to come at it from that perspective. This is a target grazing uh, symposium. There's going to be a lot of discussion about how we focus and target grazing on invasive weeds and other things. I'm going to come at it a bit from the other side of that because I know we're going to get plenty of targeting on weeds and, and plant communities that we'd like to create some impact on. And so I'll use a couple of examples in my presentation. I'm going to talk a bit about livestock distribution and how it relates to riparian health, talk a bit about livestock distribution and how it can be a tool to impact microbial water quality. If we impact microbial water quality, we've impact all other aspects of water quality, but microbial tends to be the more sexy component of water quality, what we worry about, something that can make you sick. Um, and I'm going to use an example based on a sensitive amphibian species that we've been working on in California. And most of my examples will be California-based because that's where our group's been working for the last 17 years plus. <coughs> and so we've all seen this, right? Cattle having too much fun in the riparian area. It's one of the primary issues that we focus on in the western United States. And we know, I'm, I'm, I know Derek, I know some breeds will spend a little less time in a riparian area, but it's always an uphill battle in an arid environment at the right time of the year to keep cattle out of a riparian area. And there's always some cattle in, in the herd that are going to spend a significant amount of time down there if we allow them. Come on, y'all, work with me. It's 820. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Come on like this, where we've got, you know, a stream that's a reach that's in marvelous condition, a reach that could use some help. And to, across that gradient then correlate management that's occurring with the condition of the stream at the time. Um, and so did that. And at each site, she went out and did a, a survey, a riparian health assessment, looking at stream bank stability, bank conditions, uh, plant community looked at fisheries habitat, macroinvertebrates that existed there, basically following a US EPA kind of assessment of, of stream health. At the same time, she interviewed the on-site grazing manager to figure out what the grazing management was, not, not, the, not, the, not the person who said they knew what was going on, but the person who was really there managing the site, and basically interviewed them to whether they were using off-site water, whether they were using herding, these distribution tools, drift fencing, uh, the season of grazing, the frequency of grazing, and she looked at site characteristics, knowing that all sites are not the same, will not respond to grazing the same. And to give you just a, a glimpse of what she found relative to distribution, which was what we're here to talk about, the positive, some of the positive correlations she found to riparian health were off-stream attractants, such as water tanks and supplement, in days per year. There was a positive association between that activity and stream health, riparian health. There was a positive correlation between herding to, for the specific purpose of controlling utilization in the riparian area um, and time spent in that riparian area. And notice the units are times or um, days per year. We asked the question, do you have off-site water, yes, no? Do you herd, yes, no? Those were not significantly correlated, um, had nothing to do with it. It was the amount of effort, it was the amount of time that they spent using these very simple old tools to um, achieve distribution and achieve the utilization. Derek talked about riparian grazing standards, achieving those standards and meeting them. So these tools are very effective. Give you a, sen a sense of what some of the, this is the product. These are model outputs out of a, of a negative binomial regression cor correlating livestock distribution effort in days per year with number of taxa. So basically in-stream insect or macroinvertebrate richness. And the site, whether the stream was fine cobble or, or gravel sediments had an effect, but overall there was a positive correlation between livestock distribution effort and richness. And this 
agrees really well. Mel George is in the back as well. He was the lead author, as was Chad Boyd and Randy Jackson with I on the recent SEEP assessment, the SEEP chapter on a bunch of us were brought together to evaluate how effective these management practices that we all as taxpayers are paying through, paying for, through conservation um, uh, initiatives. And basically, we found very similar results as we reviewed the literature and got into this, um, finding that, indeed, these riparian practices are effective if, if they're implemented and implemented correctly. So too much fun in the creek. And this is a major concern for us in California. We have about almost 40 million people, about 75 to 80 percent of our drinking water, surface drinking water, comes from rangelands. And we're very concerned about E. coli. We're very concerned about pathogens in our water. Livestock are commonly identified as a primary source. At one time, we were primarily worried about um, drinking water quality, but we're worried about irrigation water quality now as well, given that a significant amount of our surface water is used to irrigate fresh produce crops, such as spinach and you probably heard we've had some E. coli outbreaks related to spinach, and contamination of irrigation water is one of the likely sources. So a fairly big issue for us, and a growing issue, I think, for the rest of the nation on rangelands, not in this young girl's glass of water. And so if we think about rangelands and their capacity to filter pollutants runoff, from runoff, it's quite high. Most of our rangelands have a relatively high infiltration rate. They're relatively long travel distances. And so we have a significant com capacity for these lands to filter pollutants that might be in runoff. But we've got to work with that capacity. We've got to give it a chance. And that's where livestock distribution comes to play. And if we think about then <coughs> where livestock manure, because most of these pathogens are fecal born, are distributed, we find in California, particularly during the dry season, that about 60% of cattle fecal, fecal loading, and, and I've measured this, yes, I went to school for more years than I want to admit, and one of the first things I did when I got out of college was go to California, work with Mel George and others, and we measured the fecal loading and developed very extensive statistical models to predict where livestock would take a dump. And we found that about 60% of fecal loading was near livestock attractants in summer, a water tank, in shade, those types of areas. So using these attractants, to pull animals away from areas that we're concerned about, near streams, or areas where we get a significant runoff. We can use salt, feed, water, shade if we don't have it. It's a very unshaded environment to attract cattle, and thus their pathogens, away from these vulnerable areas. And we can do that very, um, very effectively. Now, talked to a bunch of cowboys about this. They're like, well, gee, Doc, we knew that a long time ago, but I've seen Forest Service grazing allotments closed in the past because we could not provide best available science. We could not provide papers to demonstrate this. I've sat in the room and seen allotments closed 10, 12 years ago because we weren't able to basically provide this kind of data and demonstrate to the general public and the concerned public that something as simple as a salt block could really reduce your risk of getting sick. And so thinking then about so we move that fecal pat back away from the stream using some distribution tool. That allows that attenuation process to function. Let me show you how effective it is, particularly in our landscape. So we've got a fecal pat, hits the ground, we've got rainfall, get an event. We find that over 90%, oftentimes more like 99%, and I'm looking at E. coli in this particular case, but you look at C. parvum or salmonella, they all function the same. Almost 90% of it is retained right in the fecal pat right there to begin with. So that photo I had where the cattle were standing in the creek, even if we can get them not standing in the creek and just a meter, half meter away, we've got a 90% reduction. So immense potential. Um, and then for each additional yard or meter, something escapes here as surface flow is running off. An additional 99.99% is trapped within one yard. So huge reductions can occur with very short distances. Do you guys in your states, people talk about fence back distances and buffer distances when they're talking about water quality regulation? In my state, they talk about 300 feet. As soon as you poke them, they say uh, 300 feet. We're talking about three feet here getting you know, over 99.99% reduction. So we can have huge effect with short distances, and these distribution tools can be extremely effective. And so rather than think, is it, can you all hear me? OK, there you go. And so if, if you think about um, 
if you think about the range rather than a buffer strip, if you think about the entire range as a buffer, which is how I think about it when we're thinking about distribution tools, we're distributing fecal material and pollutants of concern upslope as much as we can, making use of that forage, so there's an economic reason to do it, which is always easier to sell to a producer um, than just do it because of water quality, which is often uphill for me. Um, but if we can get that fecal pat upslope, <clears throat> then the entire range can focus, can, can serve as a buffer over 90% trapped in the fecal pat. For every meter, now we're talking hundreds of meters, 99.9% .9 trapped per yard, per meter. And then, thinking back to the riparian grazing and having that riparian area function appropriately, we're finding as we look at transport of these pathogens through riparian areas that are functioning versus not, some data that I'm not showing you, I'd be happy to share the paper with you, we can find an additional 80% trapped within a functional riparian area compared to one that's not functioning. So we begin to get this series of natural filters that are really purging this stuff out of the water and distribution being a key part of this in our western rangeland. And I agree with Derek, once stocking rate is correct. If stocking rate's not correct, you can't do anything. And so too much fun in somebody's habitat. So we've talked about water quality, we've talked about riparian areas. Um, Dr. Leslie Roach is in the room, has done a significant amount of work looking at a species of concern in California, lives up in the mountains, Yosemite toad, lives in meadows, which are also the areas for which we use a lot of summer feed, support a lot of our livestock. About 70,000 cattle in California spend the summer in U.S. Forest Service mountain meadow. And so Yosemite toad is a species of special concern. It's a nominee for federal endangered species list. It lives in the central Sierra Nevada, and it makes it use of meadows at high elevations above 6,000 feet for breeding and rearing habitat. Those are also key grazing areas for our livestock. And the question we were posed with was, are, li are cattle displacing Yosemite toad from their breeding habitat by spending too much time having too much impact in those meadows? And so to get at that question, uh, which is fundamentally a distribution question, we'll put 100 cows into a 100,000 acre allotment. It's primarily a forested landscape with you know, less than 1% of the landscape being grazable mountain meadows, and that's also where a lot of the drinking water is. So looking across three allotments, Blazing Game, Dinky, and Patterson Mountain allotment, on the Sierra National Forest, trying to get at whether or not cattle grazing and toads are, cattle grazing is displacing toads in these meadows, we looked at 24 meadows over three years, and we looked at utilization by both cattle as well as toad, thinking about livestock as an animal requiring habitat, just as a toad is an animal requiring habitat are they selecting for the same habitat, and what are the drivers of habitat selection for these animals? And so <coughs> Leslie developed a, a conceptual model, and I thought did a, a really marvelous job of, of expanding this project. This is what we posed by the Forest Service, basically, our livestock affecting Yosemite toad occupancy, when in reality the question is much broader than that, and I think we have to keep that in mind as we think about how livestock are utilizing the landscape. And so, thinking about broadly then Yosemite toad and what they might need is a habitat determinant meadow wetness. So these meadows ranged from extremely wet, almost fens, to moist. And plant community thus ranged from grasses and forbs to, you know, Nebraska sedge and other, other species that are very wet. And thinking that, well, toads like wet habitats, so meadow wetness is probably a big factor in addition perhaps to livestock grazing and determining whether or not Yosemite toad is occupying a site. We think about then, so say this is true, that's fine, but unless we understand what livestock are responding to, there, it's going to be difficult for us to formulate management solutions to this problem. So we decided, well, what are livestock likely outside of big, big spatial scale issues like there's a stream that's too high to cross or it's an isolated meadow, but in general, what are they responding to? And it's very likely forage productivity in a given meadow, as well as forage quality in a given meadow. And so these two things we formulated in our model would be factors that would drive cattle grazing, which then might affect Yosemite toad, or might, or might not. Put that in here primarily to let you know there's not always a negative relationship, and we've got to figure out how livestock and the species that we're concerned with are utilizing the landscape and make our distribution grazing management decisions accordingly. And so, as I look at the ecological values of managing livestock, I, I see Im improvements in hydrologic function, particularly in riparian function. I see potential for improvements in, in water quality and providing clean water. Um, I see potential improvements in habitat quantity as well as quality. 
we've, we've demonstrated improvements in plant and animal diversity, uh, in-stream macroinvertebrates being one example. If you read through the SEEP um, chapter, you'll see others, other examples for birds and other small mammals. And I think since distribution is allowing us to make use of that additional third, often, in, case, in many cases more, of the landscape in terms of forage, as well as from my perspective and what I deal with on a regular basis, there's cost to all of these things for a manager. There's cost to meeting these particular outcomes and overhead associated with dealing with Clean Water Act, dealing with Endangered Species Act. There's profitability in terms of increasing forage production, forage utilization, but there's also profitability in being able to comply with the various acts and regulatory vehicles that are behind these other things. And so with that, I have time for questions. Derek's told me I'm down to 30 minutes. Yes.